Imagine a place allegedly built for health and safety in which those individuals that go inside, when they go inside, <clears throat> are supposed to better themselves, are supposed to become a quote unquote active member of society. Except once you go into this place, it's the opposite that happens. You degrade, you become less than you were before, and you have essentially both cognitive and physical degradation. You never get better, you get worse. And in fact, you get worse to the extent that you might even forget your own name. Now, once inside such a facility, there's no escaping it. There are all these mechanisms and ways to capture those that attempt to escape. So that even though you have come to the realization that this place is bad, you cannot get out. Now this place was set up by what we're going to term the global health system, but it can be called many other things. Either way, it is an insidious mechanism <coughs> or system, which is designed to set up the facilities that we just described. And it's not about benefiting anyone exactly. The idea around the global health system is that in fact it's all built around the idea of degradation of health. A lot of people assume that when they see the word health it means good health, but it doesn't say that. To start with, one of the foundational documents of this global health system can be found in the Cardinal Principles of Secondary Education. A report on the of the Commission on the Reorganization of Secondary Education appointed by the National Education Association. This is a de from the Department of Interior Bureau of Education Bulletin 1918 number 35. In this document we have an entity called the Principals Council. The principal may select from his teachers a council, each member of which shall be charged with the responsibility of studying the activities of the school with reference to objective. Plans for realizing these objectives should be discussed by the principal and the council. Without impairing in any way the ultimate responsibility of the principal, it will as a rule increase the efficiency of the school if the principal encourages initiative on the part of the council members and delegates to them such responsibilities as he finds they can discharge. The members of such council and their duties are suggested as follows. Health director. This council member should seek to ascertain whether the health needs of the pupils are adequately met. For this purpose, he should consider the ventilation and sanitation of the building, the provisions for lunch, posture of pupils, the amount of homework required, the provision for physical training, and the effects of athletes. He should find out whether the pupils are having excessive social activities outside of school and devise means for gaining the cooperation of parents in the proper regulation of work and recreation. You may well see whether the teaching of biology is properly focused upon hygiene and sanitation. The citizenship director. Citizenship director should determine whether the pupils are developing initiative and the sense of personal responsibility. He should foster civic mindedness through the school paper, debating society, and the general school exercises, and give suggestions for directing the thinking of the pupils to significant problems of the day. Curriculum directors, as discussed in section 16 of this report for each important group of vocations for which the school offers a curriculum or group of curriculums there should be a director to study the needs of those vocations and find out the respect respection in which the graduates are succeeding or failing in meeting legitimate vocational demands with the knowledge thus gained he should strive to improve the work offered by the school one of these curriculum directors should have charge of preparation for college and normal schools. He should obtain the records of graduates attending those schools and find out the strong and weak points in their preparation. He will advise with pupils in leading to enter the institution as to the work they should be take uh, in the high school. <clears throat> Director of Vocational and Educational Guidance. And so we're going to stop there, but I think we well, should anyway get the point. Next, we have, uh, under the cardinal principles as well, this book. 
Aside from the immediate discharge of these specific duties, every individual should have a margin of time for the cultivation of personal and social interests. This leisure, if worthily will recreate his powers and enlarge and enrich life, thereby making him better able to meet his responsibilities. The unworthy use of leisure impairs health, disrupts home life, lessens vocational efficiency, and destroys civic-mindedness. The tendency in industrial life aided by legislation is to decrease the working hours of large groups of people, while shortened hours tend to lessen the harmful reactions that arise from the prolonged strain they increase, if possible, the importance of preparation for leisure in view of these considerations, education for the worthy use of leisure is of increasing importance as an objective. To discharge the duties of life and to benefit from leisure, one must have good health. The health of the individual is essential also for the vitality of the race and the defense of the nation. Health education is therefore fundamental. Now notice, of course, health education does not actually have to do with good health, as we see today. There are various processes such as reading, writing, arithmetical computations, and oral and written expression that are needed as tools in the affairs of life. Consequently, command of these fundamental processes will, while not an end in itself, is nevertheless an indispensable objective. And finally, the realization of the objectives already named is dependent upon ethical character, that is, upon conduct founded upon right principles, clearly perceived and loyally adhered to. One has to wonder what their quote-unquote right principles are. I'm sure we all have a good idea now, nowadays. Good citizenship, vocational excellence, and the worthy use of leisure go hand-in-hand hand with critical or ethical character. They are at once the fruits of sterling character and the channels through which such character is developed and made manifest. On the other hand, character is meaningless apart from the will to discharge the duties of life, and on the other hand, there is no guarantee that these duties will be rightly discharged unless principles are substituted for impulses. However well intentioned, such impulses may be. Consequently, ethical character is at once involved in all the other objectives and at the same time requires specific consideration in any program of national education. So far, so good, right? This is a completely innocent document, and they're not doing anything nefarious here at all. So now we're going to go ahead and get into the physical aspect. There you have the construction of this idea of the asylum and the cardinal principle. This asylum structure of rehabilitation in prisons, Department of Corrections, as it's called, of the school system, in which every single layer of your life is manipulated and controlled down to your leisure time or your quote-unquote excessive social activities. The nursing homes where old people go in and once again never get better, in fact they just get worse, they wait out their days to die inside of an enclosed facility. All of these structures all focused around this really creepy, disturbing idea of the asylum, all of these came up in the 20th century. They did not exist before the 20th century. This global health system was imposed during the 20th century. It is based around that book that we just read, The Cardinal Principles. And so now we're going to read about the effect of physical, essentially poisoning or drugging, which is known to be done in asylums to actually induce cognitive decline. Now, there's a couple reasons why they would do something like that, most of which are found in horror movies and things on that subject. But either way, in order to induce cognitive decline, one of the primary mechanisms is through the water system and poisoning. So this book is Toxicology of Fluorine, Symposium at Bern, 15 to 17 October, 1962. Dr. T. Gordonoff is edited by a uh, professor at the University of Bern. Chronic fluorine poisoning caused by the drinking of subterranean waters containing excessive quantities of fluorine. With limited time of 20 minutes at my disposal, I shall be able to touch only briefly 
on a few of the most important aspects of my research on chronic fluorine poisoning. In my publications, I have summarized the results of my field and laboratory investigations into chronic fluorine intoxication in man and animal conducted in the course of the past 25 years. In these publications, I have also made an attempt to refer to and discuss the most relevant points in some hundreds of publications made by the foremost investigators and writers in chronic fluorine poisoning. As early as 1938, I reported the devastating effects and excessive concentrations of minerals, especially fluorides in underground drinking waters, had in northwestern Cape Province and the health of man and animal. At that time, I warned that if the necessary steps to prevent the drinking of water containing excessive quantities of fluorides were not taken, in years to come, many of the inhabitants, especially the children of that area, would show not only severe damage to their teeth, as they already did in 1938, but what much more serious will suffer from the serious disturbances of the bone system, legs, arms, back. These predictions were, this prediction was proved true when in 1959 we investigated mysterious bone disease in some 200 children in the Kenbart District, northern western Cape Province. At the time of writing, more cases of mysterious bone disease, suspected chronic fluorine poisoning among children in northwestern Cape Province, were being investigated. The results of this investigation will be made known as soon as they are available. In 1960, I investigated mysterious bone disease in children and adults in the Rotan area, Potgaitersis district. I, think, I don't think I said that right. Transvaal. Also, these cases proved to be fluorine caused by the drinking of or fluorosis caused by the drinking of underground water containing excessive quantities of fluorine. At the moment, further cases of suspected fluorosis in children and adults are being investigated in an area not very far from Rotan, where chronic fluorine poisoning has already been diagnosed. The result of this investigation will be available in the near future. So there we get it. Not only is the water poisoned, however, but so is the food. And when they poison all the elements of consumption, including the air, then you have, essentially speaking, uh, multiple points of ingress into your body to cause cognitive and physical decline. Of course, as we all know, with pharmaceutical drugs, which were usually just called pharmaceuticals, but are drugs, either way, they have a very nasty line of side effects. Those side effects are not side effects. They are prime, the prime effects, the prime purpose of pharmaceutical drugs. It's to cause damage. So not only do you get it through pill form, prescribed to fix all of the issues that are caused by the poisoning of water, air, and food. Now, the system, of course, also has an extensive surveillance mechanism. Not just people, you know, like your directors and your council members, but it's also technology, it's objects, it's various things to ensure that the inmates of the global health system asylum do not step out of line. And of course, that means that they'll be looking for talk, right? Uh, as it was determined in that book, The Cardinal Principles, excessive social activities and, of course, to gain cooperation. Sounds like forced compliance, of course. But those are their words. Now, in this facility, one of the main aspects to focus on is the importance of the uniform. The first and lowliest person in this system is recognized by a uniform and a uniform alone. That's something that will be easily noticeable in this global health asylum system is that what you what uniform you wear matters most. Now the mid-level people, the administrators, well I'm not sure I would call them mid-level, they're just above the lowly, the lowly inmates. Right above them will be your administrators and they all wear a particular uniform and they all have a particular look about them. Essentially speaking, the individual matters not in this system, only what they wear. Now, a step above the administration are your, what they're called in an asylum, orderlies. But here we have a variety of words for them. But essentially speaking, they are the security role, the protective mechanism, the way to enforce compliance. And these come in a myriad of different uniforms. But either way, 
it is the uniform alone which is taught to be respected inside of this global health asylum structure. It is not the individual. It is not that the uniform represents a capable individual with specific types of training and abilities that should be respected. Rather, it is taught that it's the recognition of the clothing that is worn that should be respected and nothing else. Once that clothing is taken off, that person is as insignificant as all the others which do not, which, well, the not wearing of uniform is simply an indicator of being the lowly level initiate inmate of this global health system. Now, the next level, the one if you were attempting to emulate, would be the overall uniform of the council members, the principals, those types of people. And they do wear uniforms. They wear a very specific set of clothing to show their status, their position inside of the global health asylum. And we are trained through our um, through our uh, mental programming, or as it said, the cardinal principles, directed thinking to recognize solely, solely what is worn, the outward appearance the outward recognition of position. That is what we're trained to recognize. Anybody else who's trained differently will automatically see past this facade and will not mesh within the system and thus will become inimical to it. Now there's another element that all of the facilities within this glo global uh, health system have, and that is public theater. Inside of airports, you have the reception desks in which you have to stand in really meticulously set up lines and revolve around a separate section from the inductees into that facility. Now, all these facilities are set up like that, and it all comes back to the ticket booth that you find at any cinema or theater. When you go to park your car, there is a ticket booth which has barriers. Now the barriers are pretty easy to drive through, as many have discovered. But that's not the purpose behind it. It is all about mental programming. And it's the same with toll roads and all of these other things. It is all part of controlling the mechanism that is the global health system asylum. And it is reflected in the ticket box of the theater as well as the reception desk of the airport. Now, the interesting part about this is that wherever you go, you get a ticket. If you go to board an airplane, you get a ticket. If you go to watch a movie in a cinema, you get a ticket. If you go to the police station, you get a ticket. If you go wait in line anywhere for anything, you have to take a ticket. Now, another thing that these all, all these people have is busy work for every in new entry, every new inductee. Anybody who is just joining has a checklist, a list of things to go down and do to waste their time and make busy work. Now, on top of this, you also have people who have been there for a while, say in an asylum, it would be a quote unquote senior inmate who would then be in charge of the new ones and the same with the military and school system and prisons. Now, the important part about all of these entities having theaters, either it's uh, movie night at the school, it's movie night at the prison, movie night at the asylum, or it's a theater play at the church, a theater play at the school, theater play at the prison, or a theater play at the asylum. All of these structures that are all apparently similar in pattern and setup, they all have their brainwashing system, which revolves around public theater and cinema. Now, another element that we find with the asylum scattered into the schools, the prisons, the uh, hotels, pretty much every place that we go, the airport, right, <clears throat> or the train station, it doesn't matter where you go on this planet. Any of these facilities, they're all going to have that same thing that the asylum has, which is Nothing, everything's done in pleasant tones, and everything that might quote-unquote trigger the inmates is avoided. 
which is the idea behind paintings that have no real purpose. Because it's all about the pleasant colors, the simple shades, the way to keep inmates from having a breakdown or reacting to triggering uh, stimuli. Now we get an understanding what was actually behind the COVID shields, the protective screen that we find so pervasive in asylums, prisons, and theaters. All of these entities have that in common, and that is the reason for the imposition of the COVID shield. Now, interestingly, this very idea is found in the movie Shutter Island, as well as many other sort of thriller horror movies of that type of genre, mostly set around an older time period, and in fact designed to obfuscate your understanding and to distract you away from the current global health system asylum that we're living in. Now, <clears throat> under the <clears throat> brief description on Wikipedia, Shutter Island is a 2010 American neo-noir psychological thriller film directed by Martin Scorsese. It is adapted by Leida Calogridis from the 2003 novel of the same name by Dennis Lehane about a deputy U.S. Marshal who comes to Shutter Island to investigate a psychiatric facility after one of the patients goes missing. It stars Leonardo DiCaprio, Mark Ruffalo, and Ben Kingsley, Max von Sydow, and Michelle Williams in supporting roles. Released on February 19, 2010, Shutter Island received generally positive reviews from critics, was chosen by the National Board of Review as one of the top 10 films of 2010, and gross blah blah blah. So that one line there tells you what it's about, which is the investigation of a missing patient at a psychiatric facility, and as it says in the title, it's an, on an island. So we're going to find a theme here with islands. There's Alcatraz Island, is a small 1.25 mile or Two kilometer offshore from San Francisco, California, United States. The island was developed in the mid 19th century with facilities for a lighthouse, a military fortification, and a military prison. In 1934, the island was converted into a federal prison, Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary. Strong currents around the island and cold water temperatures made escape nearly impossible, and the prison became one of the most notorious in American history. The prison closed in 1963, and the island is now a major tourist attraction. Beginning in November 1969, the island was occupied for more than 19 months by a group of Native Americans, initially primarily from San Francisco. And here's more of your global health system propaganda garbage to train your thinking because we're feeble-minded inmates of an asylum. We were later joined by AIM and other urban Indians from other parts of the country who were part of a wave of Native American activists organizing public protests across the U.S. through the 1970s. In 1972, Alcatraz was transferred to the Department of Interior. The uh, lovely publicators of that Cardinal Principles document, mind you, to become part of Golden Gate National Recreation Area. It was designated as a National Historic Landmark in 1986. Next, we have Seagate Prison, or Seagate Federal Penitentiary, was a maximum security prison off the coast of Georgia. And this is from the Marvel Comics uh, universe. Now, for a document that sort of describes how this whole thing works, how we have essentially been admitted into, without our knowledge, or with our knowledge, without our knowledge, doesn't really make a difference here. Either way, we've been admitted into this global health system asylum with no choice in the matter. So the explanation of that comes from the state of Pennsylvania and the Lunacy Law of 1883. And here's a bunch of other stuff on it, but either way, it was published in 1907. Like I said, most of the stuff got rolling during the 20th century. And here's a list of names that apparently were on the committee on lunacy. So here, if a person against whom the proceedings are taken shall demand and write... Oh, well, first I should start with. Upon the day fixed for the hearing, the court shall require the presence of the person against whom the petition is presented. Unless there is positive testimony to the effect that such person cannot be brought into court with safety to him or herself... At such hearing, the court shall take the testimony of all parties in interest and of such other witnesses as the petitioner and the person against whom proceedings are instituted or any other member of his or her family. He or she may see fit to summon. On the question 
of the inability of the person against whom the proceedings are taken to care for his or her property because of mental deficiency. If the court on such hearing shall be satisfied that the person against whom the proceedings are taken is not able, owing to sanity or weakness of mind, to take care of his or her property, then it shall be the duty of the court to decide and enter a decree accordingly and appoint a guardian to take care of the same. So there's our big word there, the guardian. And then skip down below here. From and after the decree that the person against whom the same is entered is insane or so weak in mind that he or she is unable to take care of his or her property, the said person shall be wholly incapable of making any contract or gift, whatever, or any instrument in writing, and the entry of such decree shall be notice of such incapacity, and said person shall be a ward of the court appointing such guardian. So there you go. That's how you get, essentially speaking, uh, entered into the asylum as an inmate, regardless of any law to the contrary, protest, it doesn't matter, they'll just do it, and they have done it. We are all inmates in this disturbing asylum in which you only get worse, you never get better. Naturally, it will come down to the property as we see here. Guardian shall have full power over the same in directing an allowance for the said ward and the support and maintenance of his wife or his children, so they take over your family too, and the education of his or her minor children. That's, of course, because they're now going to be entered as wards of the state as well. And shall enter a decree of sale, mortgaging, leasing, or conveyance upon ground rent of the real estate or any part thereof of the said ward. Whenever in the opinion of the court it is necessary for the support and maintenance of the said ward or his family or the education of his or her minor children or the payment of his or her debts or where it is for the interest and advantage of the said ward that the same shall be sold, mortgaged, leased, or let on ground rent and all absolute sales in fee simple except as here and after provided shall be public sale or fondue and may be either entirely for cash or partially on credit and after full advertisement for at least 20 days by handbills, blah, blah, blah. So you get the point. This is all about, essentially speaking, stealing everything and turning our lives into this hellish asylum prison that we all are forced to live in. That's what this is all about, and that's what the global health system is all about, and that's what every single facility involved is also all about. Doesn't matter where you go, you're still an inmate, basically. So the definition of a guardianship, a position of protecting or defending something, that's what they always talk about. They talk about it in terms of for your protection, right? That's what the uh, tagline for COVID period of nonsense was about, which is in some way still going on. The position of being legally responsible for the care of someone who is unable to manage their own affairs. Legally, of course, means reduced to writing, even though who knows how they're using it here. She was granted temporary guardianship of three children. There's another word they love to use a lot. It's temporary. No, it's not. It's never temporary. But either way, the guardianship of the children is one thing. But the big thing involved here is the guardianship of the real estate of tangible value. That gives you a monetary motive and incentive to render people as mentally defective so that you can take all their stuff. It's got to be the oldest motive that has ever existed for theft. Now here we have types of guardianship of minors for adults of elderly. So while you're a minor, you're a ward of the state. Then you become an adult ward of the state. Then you become an elderly ward of the state. You also have medical guardians, pets, the financial, that's the big one here, and conservatorship. So mostly we're going to focus here on the financial. This brings us to a particularly interesting document called Form ADV, Uniform Application for Investment Advisor Registration Report by Exempt Reporting Advisors. Under item one, identify information, full name of the or the full legal name is Trust Asset Management LLC. That's your first one. Now this document is going to get very interesting. 
there's a couple different codes and designators listed here and there. But the address is listed at 1900 St. James Place in Houston, Texas. So we have Security Investment Management, LLC, under other business names. Now, mind you, this is still the same one that we're talking about. Location of books and records are at SSNC Technologies, Incorporated, and it only states one south road for the address. No city, state, country, nothing, just one south road. Next, we have Rack Space. This is listed at one fanatical place, Wincrest, Texas. So far, we're still in Texas. And this is states it's a email archive vendor. Then we have Pershing Advisor Solutions, one Pershing Plaza, Jersey City, New Jersey. And this is fund-related information. So I think the big one, of course, would be that one that we looked at before with no listed address. That's the one that's going to contain all your, likely anyway, your smoking gun and, uh, paperwork. Of course, this paperwork could be considered smoking gun in many ways. For one, the employees in, uh, including full-time, part-time, and clerical workers is 10. That's a big deal. Especially considering the pooled investment vehicles other than investment companies and business development companies is 1,323,206 and 143. And there's, that's shared by four clients. In addition, we have uh, corporations or other businesses not listed above at $69,106,047. And then, of course, the total would be one billion twenty to um, twenty million nine hundred eight thousand six hundred and fifty-two shared between four people. And here, under regulatory assets under management, we have discretionary at two billion four hundred thirteen million two hundred twenty thousand eight hundred and forty-two under. 152 total accounts. Then under the separate accounts section, there's not much information as far as uh, what this is, except that there's 95% is in securities, 1% in derivatives, 1% in U.S. government and agency bonds, and 4% in exchange trade equity securities. However, this also lists something called sovereign bonds, which I think would be interesting to look into. But this page doesn't really give us much um, more than that. So next, under custodians for separately managed accounts, we have the Purchasing Advisor Solutions, LLC, with... 1,090,014,699 out of Jersey City, New Jersey. Next, we have Evergreen Investment Advisors, LLC. Now, that's a name to pay attention to right there. And they apparently are not listed with an address. Either way, that's a, a name to look at is... And that's under financial industry affiliation. Also, we have the, a private fund under the name of AXIS, A-X-Y-S, Capital Income Fund, LLC, uh, with a manager, trustee, director, trust asset management, LLC. So here's something to be, notice here. A juridical entity can be a trustee. can also be a guardian. It's not a person. It's a juridical person being a company, association, organization, etc. Essentially a fictional creation. And this Axis Capital Income Fund lists no street address, but states it's incorporated out of Delaware. And that's not really shocking considering my other videos on this subject. Now, the current gross asset value of the private fund is 236655 and 204 so that's interesting. Now the uh, auditor information is Deloitte and Touch LLP out of Houston, Texas. That would, of course, be a um, would be lawyers, right, or attorneys. 
what you want to call them, but either way, they're just paper pushers and they run uh, laundering rackets. Then the uh, records filed with additional custodians. We have the Citigroup Global Markets Incorporated out of New York, JP Morgan Chase Bank out of Houston, Texas. And we have that other name, SSNC Technologies Incorporated out of Harrison, New York. So here we actually get the location and then that really vague street address that we saw earlier. So we are looking a little bit more into that particular entity of SSNC Technologies Incorporated. Then we also have a private fund under the name AXIS, A-X-Y-S, Capital Total Return Fund, LLC. Now, mind you, this is a different fund from the other A-X-Y-S fund, the private funds. And this is formed out of, once again, Delaware. So the AXIS Capital Total Return Fund, LLC, formed out of Delaware, is managed and owned by the Trust Asset Management, LLC, with a current gross asset value of $107,250,933. Next, we have the Lighthouse Balanced Fund, LLC, also out of Delaware. And there's a very particular reason for that, and that's the fact that you can't find any information on the companies filed out of Delaware. Current gross asset value of the private fund is $643,302,696. We have also the Lighthouse Stable Growth Fund, I, LLC, there they're just changing a, a uh, slight variation in the names of these different entities. Also formed out of Delaware and also controlled by the same entity, the Trust Asset Management, LLC. That fund is valued at $335,991,308. Next, we have uh, custody, the number of clients for a... Uh, it, or have custody of one billion three hundred twenty-three dollars uh, two hundred six thousand one hundred forty-three dollars is four. Those are the number of clients. Now below that, you also have four clients for six hundred nine million one hundred six thousand and forty-seven dollars, and I expect they're also the same four. So this, of course, is what you look at and say this is money laundering. Now we have the Evergreen Investment Advisors under control persons, and they're uh, allegedly out of Chicago, 150 South Wacker Drive, 31st floor, uh, Illinois, United States. And um, they control, as the managing member, the Evergreen Real Estate Partners, LLC. And then we have William Mark Hamilton, out of 1900 St. James Place, Houston, Texas, Suite 300, Chairman and CEO of the North Star Memorial Group, LLC. Then we have Garrett Claude House. Garrett Claude House is the Executive Committee North Star Evergreen LLC Managing and Chief Executive Officer, Evergreen Investment Advisors LLC Portfolio Manager, Member of the Advisory and Investment Boards, Evergreen Real Estate Partners, LLC. And uh, apparently out of 201 West 5th Street, Austin, Texas. Then we have Daniel Paul Poling out of 156 Wacker Street, or 150 South Wacker Street, 31st floor, Chicago, Illinois, and Principal Evergreen Investment Advisor, LLC Executive Committee, North Star Evergreen, LLC. I mean, we should be noticing patterns with these names by now. Hunter Prescott Shank, out of 150 South Wacker Drive, Chicago, Illinois, 31st floor. Go figure. And of course, he's the Executive Committee, North Star Evergreen LLC Managing Director, Evergreen Investment Advisor LLC. Then we have Brian L. Sullivan, 1900 St. James Place, Houston, Texas. They all have the same addresses, basically, just scattered here and there. And President North Star Memorial Group. Of course, they're all involved in the same entities as well, which are controlling other entities. These are, of course, your four, uh, your four clients that distribute this vast wealth of funds, which are probably based out of, as it says, pooled assets or pooled resources. So money laundering, basically, and theft. But eventually, we're going to get into the implications of that on a. Uh, regional and local level. So now, uh, as we see, there are all these individual entities come out of Delaware.
or at least they're filed through Delaware. Delaware is a primary filing mechanism or vehicle for uh, business laundering. And we have North Star Evergreen LLC is owned by North Star Memorial Group. Evergreen Memorial LLC also owned, owned by North Star Evergreen. Evergreen Real Estate Partners is owned by Evergreen Memorial. Evergreen Investment Advisors is owned by Evergreen Real Estate Partners. And MJ Capital Partners is owned by Evergreen Investment Advisors. That is exactly what shell company money laundering looks like. Now the appointment of agent for service process is Stephen C. Ludwig, Chief Compliance Officer. And finally, on this document, we should note that down at the bottom under uh, non-resident investment advisor execution page, there is no signature nor printed name, but there is a CRD number. That's pretty strange, isn't it? Now, in order to get into the local level or implications of what we just read, we'll go ahead and look at a place called Logan, Ohio, which is perfect example to explain what we're looking at here. Now, if you go to Google and put in the word health, you'll notice that for the size of the population that live in Logan, there's a pretty large number of quote-unquote health centers or uh, places in reference to health care, right? Health management or guardianship of people's health. Now, if you put in medical centers, you'll find some, of course, might overlap, but either way, there's so many in relation to the population that actually live in the region. There's quite a few, more than are necessary. In addition, under the property records, we have the total property tax divided up into a pie chart, of which 54.4% goes to the school district, whatever that means. That's not really surprising. Next is the corporation. Now, man, mind you, the corporation means the municipal corporation. Then we have the county. Then you have a large section taken up by developmental disabilities, mental health, the health department, and the senior center. So that's quite a lot of investment going into this asylum structure, this global health asylum concept. That's a lot. So these people steal all your stuff, take everything under the guise of your mental feebleness, have a monetary incentive to make people in an area mentally feeble, and then you're supporting them in their doing that with your extorted tax money. Among the tax levies, we'll notice that the majority are done by medical service, the De Department of Developmental Disabilities, mental health, Logan Hawking Health, Senior Citizen, Senior Center, Regional Food Center, Children's Services, and then the county and some other ones. But most of them, of course, revolve around this concept of the global health system asylum. Now, we also have a school bond is one that's listed. The general fund, uh, Logan City bond, uh, general fund, and some other ones here. But as we noticed before, there's a, a long line of these uh, health health related entities that are making multiple tax levies one after the other. Also in Logan, we find there's an entity called the Hawking County Commissioner's Courthouse. That's a name that you would find on, say, a business document, right? That's a weird name, by the way. But that entity owns quite a great deal of real estate in the city itself. This particular entity owns the fairgrounds, and there we've got one main street east listed as the courthouse, owned by the Hawking County Commissioner's Courthouse. Isn't that weird? The courthouse owns itself, apparently, at least according to this. But who knows what that... Um, what that name actually means. And they own quite, or that entity owns quite a great deal of land in the city itself. Now also we have Eastgate Properties Incorporated. 
which owns some prime real estate down the main street, East Main Street 63 specifically, of the city of Logan. Now in the United Kingdom, there's a property filing of Bergholt Properties Limited changing its name to Eastgate Properties Limited. Also, we have Eastgate Properties UK in print, uh, uh, yeah, parentheses, limited. And the registered office of the company will be situated in England and Wales. The objects which the company established are to carry on business as a general commercial company, to carry on the business as property holding company, to hold and deal with premises comprised in flats or blocks of flats, residential commercial properties and buildings, and for that purpose to contract with the freeholder and the tenants of such properties, whether as a party to the several leases, therefore, or otherwise, and to hold all kinds of shares, securities, investment, stocks, bonds, debt, debentures, debenture stocks, life and insurance policies, rights, privileges, leases, under leases, and all types of real and personal property, and to invest monies in all forms of business, whether in the United Kingdom or overseas, to the benefit of the company. To undertake all services regarding such properties, office and factory premises, stores, shops, developments, and to do all such acts, deeds, manners, and things as may be necessary, incidental, or conduct conducive to the dual observance and performance of such covenants or stipulations or otherwise to the preservation or enhancement of the amenities, blah, blah, blah. To purchase, sell, exchange, improve, mortgage, charge, rent, lent, on lease, hire, surrender, license, accept, surrender of, and otherwise acquire and deal with any freehold, leasehold, or other property, chattels, and effects. And to effect, pull down, repair, alter, develop, or otherwise deal with any building or buildings and adapt the same for the purpose of the company's businesses. So, yeah, basically, uh, everything you might expect. Now, also, it states that it's to sell, license, develop, or otherwise deal with the undertaking any part of property or assets of the company upon which terms is the company may approve, blah, blah, blah. Invest and deal with the monies of the company not immediately required. Lend money to such persons upon such terms. And so, yeah, it's basically speaking a, a land bank. Except their focus isn't only on land. It's also on insurance policies and investment vehicles. And specifically speaking, being a guardian and engaging in this stuff overseas. That's a big one right there, especially considering Eastgate owns prime real estate in the city of Logan. Naturally, you also have these sections of indemnification. The liability of the member is limited. Um, to remunerate the directors of the company in any manner the company may think fit and to pay, provide pensions for, or make payments to or for the benefit of directors and ex-directors of the company or their dependents or connections, to distribute any property of the company and specie among the members, blah, blah, blah. So, exactly what you'd expect, right? Now, uh, I haven't done research into these other suspicious filings in this city, but in fact, the entirety of Main Street in Logan City the owners of the properties are incredibly suspicious. Pretty much all of them, all that prime real estate. And if you were to go through that city, it would be no surprise because the whole area is depressed on purpose and for exterior interests as part of this structured health asylum system, global health asylum. Here we have 48 East Main Street LLC with a P.O. box out of Cincinnati, Ohio. Naturally, this company, 48 East Main Street LLC, or here it says 48 East Main LLC, owns 48 East Main L uh, East, the address, 48 East Main Street in Logan. And guess who sold it to them? Eastgate Properties Incorporated. And before that, it was 48 on Main LTD. Go figure. Next, we have APG Media of Ohio, LLC, and this is out of Easton, Maryland, apparently, with a highly unlikely 290088 Air Park Drive address. And they're apparently owners of 72 East Main Street of Logan City, Ohio. And uh, they have APG Real Properties, LLC, sold to them by ACM Ohio, LLC, and in turn by Sodalis, LLC. Next, we have CNCY Enterprises, LTD. Now, mind you, LTD is, stands for limited. It is not a U.S. designation. The U.S. designation is, in fact, LLC. 13846 Nickel Plate Road, Logan, Ohio. And they apparently own 62 East Main Street, Logan, Ohio. 
And they were sold the property by Bell, Bruce Bell, who was in turn sold it by STJ Enterprises Incorporated. Next, we have the highly ridiculous name Maverick Investment Group, LLC, with a P.O. Box. It's their address in Logan, Ohio, and they own 3343 3, East and 345 Main Street. And Maverick Investment Group acquired it from Snowford Property Management, LLC. So, yeah, no actual local people, really, own any of the prime real estate down the main street of the city. That's not shocking when you consider the implications of the document that we previously read about the uh, four people that manage billions of dollars between them. MH and KS Holdings, LLC, about out of Amesville, Ohio, apparently owns 81 East Main Street. And originally, it was owned by Penny's Pastries LTD. And as I can attest to, that pastry company, which used to be all right, is now out of business, and the property is left derelict. Then we have Montley LLC with a P.O. box out of Athens, Ohio. So I assume that we're seeing a pattern here, hopefully. And apparently, they own East Main Street in its entirety, considering there's no actual address number there. Then we have Networth Enterprises LLC with a state route address out of Rockbridge. Now Networth Enterprises LLC was sold to property by Sean North who in turn was sold by David C. and David H. Bell. Now if we remember before from that other example uh, through this listing we also have other similar names of sales from somebody named Bell but not David C. and David H. And then we have Nostalgic Enterprises, LLC. And Nostalgic Enterprises, LLC, was sold the property by Isamal Properties, LLC, which is related to that Sean North character, and was sold by JBH Investments, LLC. And before that, it was the Patricia Montgomery trustee. And like I said before, trustees and guardians do not have to be tangible, real people. They can be juridical entities, groups, associations, organizations, companies, etc. Now we have Reborn Properties, LLV, uh, LLC, uh, with 66 East Main Street. Reborn Properties, LLC, was sold this prime real estate by somebody named Steve M. and Marty Schatz. Next, we have Scenic Hills Estates, LLC, with a P.O. Box, as we've seen that pattern here, many P.O. Box addresses. Now we have Isamal Properties, LLC, like I said before, owned by Sean North, that character. And this is for 16 East Main Street. So as we see, there's a lot of similar names and similar entities and similar patterns when it comes to the ownership of this prime real estate in this particular city. But as I said before, it's just an example of what's going on everywhere. Now, this place was sold to Isamal Properties by Linda K. McCoon, by, then by James S. Jurgensmeyer, and then by William G. Bonnie Coy. It's about the first property we've looked at that does not have some string of suspicious company names under the filing. Now we have the Marjorie A. Saving Trustee out of apparently Edge Hill Circle, it's for 97 East Main. Now, this one doesn't have any sale uh, specifications. It just states that the market value is $94,200, but the yearly taxes are $1,562. So that's interesting. And it also shows that of the total and taxes, most of it, a third, well, uh, the third uh, on the list is developmental disabilities. And that's below county. Now, the county um, has a lot of these entities incorporated into it, such as the health department, which is a standalone section that gets a large section of it, as well as the, the mental health. So, three entities all with related association, all also taking money essentially from the county and the cor a municipal corporation. And it's all geared around this construction of the Global Health System Asylum. Then we have the Bethany L. Alexander Trustee. Now this is out of the nearby city 
of Lancaster, apparently, but is, again, a piece of property, prime real estate in the city of Logan, Ohio. Now, the Bethany L. Alexander Trust was sold the property by Edwin and Timothy D. Easton, or Edwina, and then they were sold by Michael and Devil Neheiser. Now we have the Sochi Lodging LLC, which is a weird name with the state root address. Let's go look at the sales. Apparently this property has a buyer but no seller, although under uh, notes it states sales note the life estate to Wilhelmina Armstrong. And there you get another example, yet another example of this idea that we saw in a document about acquiring people's property under guardianship and then selling it out. Except in this case, I would say it relates to a dead person who was essentially speaking ruled mentally incapable so that their assets could be divvied up by the appointed guardians. Now, we have this particularly interesting, uh, in the nearby city of Lancaster, this interesting example from a company called 22 South Broad Street Corporation. Now, strangely enough, they're the owner of 22 South Broad Street in Lancaster, Ohio. Isn't that odd? That's really odd. You have a corporation named after the street that it, address that it apparently owns. That's not weird at all. Now, the seller of this property is somebody named Arlo Pfaff to the 22 South Broad Street Corporation, which is the name of the address that is being sold. Next, you have, essentially speaking, a whole area owned, uh, or this is address 205 Woodcliff Lane, by the trustee of the Sheedler of David H. Sheedler. Now, what's interesting about that is that this trust was formed in 2014 and does not specify who the trustee actually is. It just states that it's a trustee. Now, the sale to the trustee, mind you, is David H. Shadler. However, below that, you have David H. Shadler selling the property to David H. Shadler. Yeah, that doesn't sound right. Now we have this address at um, Bexnob Road, and this is owned by Lancaster Prop Co. LLC out of Brooklyn, New York. Hmm. That's kind of odd. Now, Lancaster Prop Co. was sold the property by Eckert Enterprises, LTD. And Joan Eckert apparently sold it to Eckert Enterprises. And then Winfield's Eckert, Winfield S. Eckert, sold it to Joan Eckert. Yeah, that does not sound right. Next, we have 135 West Main Street, owned by 135 West Main Street, LLC. However, the 135 Mess, uh, West Main Street LLC's uh, location is listed at uh, 1141 North Columbus Street out of Lancaster. Now, 135 West Main LLC was sold the property by Teresa W. Rickman, who was sold it by Paul J. Jr. Dana Miller. Next, we have the trustees of Barbara K. Or, and Al Stanley Allen Risch, R-I-S-C-H. Now, the property, apparently, was sold to Stanley Allen Risch by Barbara K. Risch, and then Barbara K. Risch was sold the property by blank. So that doesn't make sense either. Also, there's no mention of the actual sale to the alleged trustee owners of the property. So that's yet another discrepancy that we find in these filings. Now we have 1161 Parkview Drive, and this is Robert E. Crooner, apparently. Now, Robert E. Crooner was sold the property by Matthew J. Dodds. Matthew J. Dodds was sold it by Thomas C. Andrews. Thomas e. Andrews was sold up by Gladys E. Klump Feeman. So far, completely normal, apparently. Now we have, for the big kicker, of course, 1011 East Fair Avenue by Evergreen Property and Real Estate LLC. Now, what again was the name of that company 
involved in the ADV form document that we looked at before, where billions of dollars were managed by four people. Now, the address for this one is listed at 1011 East Fair Avenue, Lancaster, Ohio, and also at 450 Sand Hill Road, Amanda, Ohio. However, the address listed for Evergreen Property and Evergreen Real Estate LLC, as well as their um, owners, of which there were many, uh, shell corporations and, essentially speaking, false business filings, or the laundry of these entities and the individuals controlling them, well, their addresses were not in Ohio, that's for sure. Next, we have Ronald G. Haber sold the property to Evergreen Property, and then Philip Edward J. Phillips sold the property. So here, that's the main component that we see a lot, anyway is uh, a list of individuals um, any property essentially speaking nowadays that has a list of individuals have sold their property to some sort of creepy corporation which is involved in these mechanisms either that or everything's held and was held before by these phony corporate these juridical entities passing off one thing to the other on behalf of a small handful. So this is not just relegated to one section, one rinky-dink section of Ohio. It's global everywhere. Any place on the globe that you will go, you might have more difficulty tracking down the document if every place has its own way of doing things. But either way, you will find it to be the same. It is all this mechanism, this system in which all of the property and everything of tangible value is owned and controlled by a select group of individuals on everyone else's behalf. That is, essentially speaking, the idea of the asylum listed out in the lunacy laws of Pennsylvania that we read previous. Now, there's a couple ways that you can undermine the asylum, but the main one is to introduce blockers for the cognitive poisoning and physical poisoning induced. And the blockers could take many forms. It could be ashwagandha, could be zeolite, could be calcium, could be any of these natural things which will, and essentially speaking, negate the poisoning of pharmaceuticals, drugs, toxification of the water, the soil, the food, and the air. Now, another thing that you can do, of course, is start going around dressing like the principal, like the upper echelon above the enforcers. Of the asylum. Obviously, if you dress like an enforcer, then that's one thing. However, there's a lot of other ways that you can undermine the control of the asylum, and those are creative uh, mechanisms, but either way, the majority of the TV shows and movies and all the propaganda related around this topic, they never teach you exactly how to fix the issue. They always just leverage it onto like a rogue director or whatnot. Well, what about when the whole system, when the entire asylum itself is designed as an evil entity? You're not going to fix it just by taking out one director or one principal. You have to focus on it as a enemy, sick organization which is built around mental feebleness, physical feebleness. In order to defeat that, it takes a measure of creativity, not just, of course, uh, seeking to remove the neural and physical uh, damage to the inmates, the other inmates, but also to, of course, undermine the operations. And that's the fr primary focus, of course, right? That's something you see across the board is that their focus, above all else, is the continued function of their system. That is the thing that they most above all value is the continued function. So anything that undermines the function of their system, they look at as an enemy. And if you're against this, because I don't know on earth who would actually be for a global health asylum that's this twisted, well, then naturally you would want to undermine the functions of such a system, right? Because such a system is designed to poison you, to keep you... Um, mentally incapable so that all of your stuff can be stolen and all of your labor exploited.